Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we've got an episode, our 50th actually, uh, so I'm pretty happy about that, that ties together a number of the topics and discussions that we've been having in virtual legality over the past three or four months or so. Uh, There was an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, yesterday, the physical copy yesterday, I believe it was in the digital copy two days ago about Sony cracking down on sexual content in their games, in the content that is produced for the Sony PlayStation 4 platform, how that is being dealt with, and how it's not being dealt with in terms of writing actual rules down on paper for what is and isn't acceptable. And I wanted to talk about it with you today because it dives into some of the topics that we've discussed earlier. First of all, the timing. Uh, This article came out almost at exactly the same time that Sony wound up releasing the information that it did on the nature of the PlayStation 5 in Wired. We talked about that in the previous episode of Virtual Legality, and one of the questions that I had in that episode of Virtual Legality is exactly why PlayStation, why Sony was releasing that information when they had decided to do so. And I do think, while this is probably a minor aspect of that kind of conversation, I think a major newspaper in the United States, the Wall Street Journal, writing an article that maybe isn't so terribly positive about the policies that you've implemented for your platform is a good reason to leak or to give an interview to another uh, source, another magazine, another newspaper to try to change the direction of the discussion, to try to uh, distract a little bit from what might be other issues. I don't think this is a major enough story for that to have been the case necessarily. And I think that there was a great comment in the comments to this video, to the to the previous video, regarding the timing and why Sony might have made those uh, determinations to release the information to Wired that I thought was pretty apt. And that was in that article, they actually talked about the fact that they were releasing developer kits uh, then to a number of developers. They were going out into the wild, probably third parties as well as first parties. And when you have developer kits out there, when you have people analyzing what your system can do that aren't in your control, that aren't in your company, uh, it is almost always the case that certain stuff will get leaked out. People sign NDAs. Nobody wants to get burned by Sony. uh, But you're talking about a third-party developer like a Ubisoft or someone of that nature that's going to have a kit for the new system. And so they're going to know what's going on. And they're also going to have contacts and communications with your competitors, Microsoft, Nintendo, Google, what have you. And so that information was going to come out when the dev kits went uh, worldwide. And so I do think... That is part of the story as to why Sony released that information to Wired. Now, the interesting kind of counter argument there is that the Microsoft dev kits, we would expect to be out in the wild pretty similar in timing. So if they are out there, why hasn't Microsoft spoken? And I think the answer to that is they are waiting for E3 and they think they can last the next two months without significant leaks. Personally, I think they're right. Uh, But that's all in respect of timing. So this story that came out, and I'm going to go over to it right now. It's a Wall Street Journal article, which unfortunately is kept under paywall here. Uh, I have a physical copy that I'm going to be reading from and taking excerpts from. I will link the link to this digital copy in the descriptions to this video. You may or may not be able to see it depending on uh, the phases of the moon, whether you've already read Wall Street Journal articles this month, what have you, whatever rules and regulations they're making for letting you into this article. We're going to talk about the salient points from it in this episode, uh, but you can't necessarily see it on your screen, so I'm going to have some other content that I'm going to put up that's going to be apropos of nothing, completely unrelated, but just some Sony-exclusive footage uh, that uh, is not making a point at all about what they're doing here. Uh, But with that being said, this is Sony cracks down on sexually explicit content in games, move reflects concerns in the U.S. about the depiction of women, but it angers developers in Japan. So as I said, let's take a a read-through of a couple of the points here, 
And I'm just going to put on uh, some footage uh, from some other Sony first-party exclusive titles uh, that uh, uh, you might find uh, you might find interesting. Okay, so let's take a look at the article. Uh, as we said, it's Sony cracks down on sexually explicit content in games, and it starts by saying Sony Corp is cracking down on sexual content in PlayStation 4 video games globally, reflecting concerns in the U.S. about the depiction of women in games but also irritating some software developers. New in-house standards that limit sexually explicit content distinguish Sony from other game hardware makers that allow more leeway as long as the software carries a rating from a national industry body. The ESRB, those are the M's, the T's, uh, the AO's, uh, ostensibly you could possibly see out in the wild somewhere, that are put on the corners of the game boxes that you buy at the GameStop or the Best Buy or what have you. And they are designed... Uh, after the the Night Trap and Mortal Kombat hearings from the 90s to be the game industry's bulwark against more fulsome regulation, uh, more government interference into what they can and can't create. So this is essentially a game industry body, the ESRB, that helps to rate games so that the information can be conveyed to the consumer about at least some of what is in the game and the nature of what is present in the game. But again, it's important to note, that's not a government body. That was designed to head off the government at the past, very similar to the MPAA that rates movies. Uh, In essence, if you're a giant industry media source, whether it's video games or movies or, or TV, which we'll talk about in a second, you don't want the government to be telling you what's allowed and not allowed because you want to be able to control your own destiny there. And one of the ways that you can do that is to say if there's a problem, if you have Senate hearings, like Mortal Kombat, like Night Trap, way back when, uh, you can get in front of it by having your own uh, own group of folks that help rate things and help regulate to prove that you are the adults in the room and you don't need the government to come in and telling you what you're doing. I did a uh, a virtual legality episode on this uh, early on in the series that you can check out. Uh, I think it's uh, Gaming Government and You, uh, and you can check that out. It's going to be early uh, in the tens or teens that talks a little bit about the hearings. It talks a little bit about uh, what the ESA currently does and some lobbying efforts uh, from the game industry. Uh, A Sony spokesperson, uh, going back to the article, said the company has established its own guidelines so that creators can offer well-balanced content on the platform and gaming does not inhibit the sound growth and development of young people. She declined to say when these guidelines were introduced or to discuss them in detail. Uh, Certainly that... First point is an interesting one. Well-balanced content uh, is uh, not exactly what you would expect to see a spokesperson say when they're talking about eliminating content from their platform. Uh, This is obviously PR speak. It's obviously business speak for saying we don't want this here. Uh, And they're still clearly kind of fighting around the edges of what they even want to say on this topic. And maybe will or won't uh, go further than what they've already done uh, in the future, and they don't know exactly what their plans are going to be, what their plans uh, should be, and this is the kind of commentary you see when something is in flux, when a corporation still hasn't quite decided on what it's going to do. Similarly, uh, so that it does not inhibit the sound growth and development of young people uh, is an odd stance uh, to take. Again, I've got footage up here of Last of Us 2, which is a, a Sony-developed game, Apropos of nothing, of course, that isn't talking about anything regarding development of young people or murder or violence or anything related to that. But it's interesting for them to take this stance, and I think it's disingenuous. And we're going to talk about why. Uh, But one of the things that has come out is that they are concerned about streaming, that they used to allow certain things in certain territories. They used to allow certain games in Japan that they didn't allow in the United States, but that streaming has connected the world a little bit. I think it's a little bit disingenuous to even frame it in that regard because streaming has been around for a while. They try to say in this article, uh, and we'll talk about it in just a second, that it's one of the reasons why they are implementing these guidelines, but streaming was introduced in the console space by Sony in the PlayStation 4. They came up with the share button. They're the ones that have been streaming. And interestingly enough on this point, I can recall when they had some live shows, when they had some talk shows that you could use through uh, the Playroom app, Uh, that there was a whole lot of trouble uh, on live streams, on people just putting cameras in their living rooms and doing all manner of uh, 
uh, things that you wouldn't necessarily watch on TV or that you wouldn't expect to see on someone just clicking on a PlayStation 4 stream directly from their console uh, and with very little control uh, from a parental side of things over what could be seen and not seen in that uh, in that stream it itself. So Sony's been dealing with issues adjacent to this really since the PlayStation 4 was adopted, uh, but these new guidelines seem to have been developed last year uh, and in response to political commentary from the United States, largely. Uh, this article says the Wall Street Journal interviewed more than a dozen developers and executives in the U.S., Europe, and Japan at software companies that provide games for PlayStation 4. In, conform in confirming Sony's new rules, some developers expressed dismay that their creativity could be hindered. They asked not to be identified because of non-disclosure contracts with Sony and fears of jeopardizing future business with Sony. So this is the Disney problem. Uh, this is the problem where you've got somebody that has such a significant amount of market control that even the third party folks that are related to them, uh, in the case of Disney, uh, actors or directors or writers, uh, reviewers, people that are adjacent to their ecosystem, but Disney itself isn't necessarily doing anything. Like them, Sony is huge in the gaming space and has only gotten more so in this generation. The next paragraph of this article talks about that. It says, with more than 94 million units sold around the globe, the PlayStation 4 is the world's most widely used video game console and has helped drive Sony's turnaround over the past five years with $11 billion in PlayStation 4 games sold. Uh, and so what you're talking about is a major player that you can't afford to offend, that you have to speak anonymously to the Wall Street Journal on, and that maybe isn't giving a lot of context for what is and isn't acceptable on their platform. When you're talking about making something like a movie or making something like a video game, you're not talking about something simple like doing a YouTube video on virtual legality or just commenting on things. You're talking about something that takes tens or hundreds of people uh, months or years to produce. And if you get to the end of the game and it's just not allowed, you've got a real problem with paying people in payroll or otherwise just making your your life work. And we talked about this in the context of a couple of videos in virtual legality earlier. We talked about it in the context of Weedcraft uh, last week where we saw that Facebook and YouTube were reading their own terms and conditions, their own policies for advertising and demonetization and allowable videos and streams in a very specific way to prohibit certain content from uh, Weedcraft in particular and in a way that really wasn't being applied in a similar manner to movies, to TV, to even other video games that were maybe made by bigger publishers or maybe made by more famous developers. And the problems that that causes with someone trying to react to those, and I talked about uh, a chilling effect. This is a kind of common philosophy that you see talked about in the law, uh, but if you don't know what the rules are, if you don't know what is and isn't allowed, you have to take your actions in advance of the final decision. You have to decide whether or not you're going to proceed with something that could possibly be deemed obscene, could possibly be deemed problematic or otherwise uh, an issue for uh, Sony, for the movie makers, for YouTube, for Facebook. And in the absence of that actual rule set, the, something that you can actually comply with, something that is okay for you to to know that you can put money into, you've got to essentially decide whether you're going to do this or you're going to make a volleyball game or you're going to make a, a hockey game. Or you're going to do something else with the money and the time because you just don't know what essentially this black box decision-making process is going to reveal at the end of the day. And that chilling effect is real. Uh, we do see it in the law all the time. It's one of the things that the courts, especially the Supreme Court, tries to avoid. There's a notion that you hear in law school that you see in Supreme Court decisions, that you see in case law in general, that talks about uh, the readability of law, the constancy, that one of the most important things that you can have in the law is knowing when you're violating it, knowing when you're taking a, a bad step. It's one of the reasons that precedent is deemed so important, especially at the Supreme Court level, because people have organized their businesses, they've organized their lives based on a decision that's 10 or 20 or 30 years old. And when you change that precedent, you change the decisions that they've made, especially if you make something that was legal illegal, then you've got people that have maybe put millions of dollars into a business endeavor that is now deemed illegal based on a new court decision. You've got major problems and it's not really fair. It's not deemed to be fair. Uh, under the law, certainly we have an, 
smaller issue when we talk about civil items like this. And Sony, as we talked about with respect to Weedcraft and YouTube and Facebook, Sony is a private actor. They're allowed to do whatever they want. They're allowed to do what they want with what is allowed on their platform. And they can speak to if they don't want something on their platform. The other video in virtual legality that came to mind when I was reading this article was the video that I did on Steam and their policies of allowing anything goes. And when Rape Day was revealed uh, to release on Steam, the problems that they had, because nobody wants to be associated with a product like that. And Steam is, first and foremost, a private actor in the business of selling goods and services, selling, in this case, digital video games to folks. And if nobody wants to be associated with, nobody wants to be seen next to a game called Rape Day, they've got a problem. They need to kick it out. Only they don't have really the rules or the or, or the structures to kick it out, other than they say... Uh, if we see something problematic, we'll kick it out then. And that's exactly what they did with Rape Day. That's what we would have expected them to do. But it is a problem for people that are on the lines, especially the gray areas that might make something artistic, that might make something great, uh, but they aren't going to put the money in. They're not going to put the time. They're not going to put the resources in because these guidelines aren't really rules. They aren't really written down. And we'll see that at the end. Uh, Sony officials said the company has grown concerned that its global reputation could take a hit from sexually explicit content sold in a few markets. A big worry is software sold in its home market, which traditionally has had more tolerance for near nudity and images of young women who appear to be underage. Sony's home market, of course, being Japan. And like any given uh, culture, uh, different countries, different cultures, different lands have different acceptability tolerances for different things. Uh, Japan has a higher level of tolerance for these concepts of near nudity and images of young women who appear to be underage. Uh, And the United States doesn't have that same concept. Uh, And so Sony is trying to figure out exactly how to position itself as a global brand so that it doesn't get into a rape day situation, so that it doesn't have Steam's issue, so that it doesn't have uh, the situation where uh, it gets too far down the line and it has to put something up on its store that it doesn't want to, that other people wind up objecting to. And so I'm empathetic. I'm sympathetic to what Sony is doing uh, and, and what kind of things that they have to deal with. However, I'm always in favor of hard and fast rules of not putting things in guidelines and ambiguous terms uh, because it does present a problem for the folks that you want to be developing for your platform. Uh, It says, this article says in its major paragraph says, two factors last year combined to turn that unease that Sony had with the Japanese content into action. These Sony officials say one was the rise of the Me Too movement in the U.S., which pointed to the dangers of being associated with content that some might see as demeaning to women. So there's a lot of weasel words in this sentence, and I think it's interesting. It's certainly a very kind of journalistic or uh, public relations way of couching what you're saying. So they want to say Sony is concerned about Me Too. Uh, Me Too, of course, being the United States uh, fronting uh, political movement to really highlight uh, problems that women have had, primarily in the workplace and in power structures uh, with sexual harassment or feeling uncomfortable uh, on a sexual basis. <clears throat> and uh, what they wind up saying is uh, the Me Too movement is pointed to the dangers of being associated with content, not actually any content in, in particular, but being associated with it, that some might see as demeaning to women. So we've got being associated with and some might see as things that kind of lower the threshold for allowing Sony to do this because being associated with something isn't the same as endorsing it, isn't the same as producing it yourself. Although we can see that Sony has absolutely no issue producing things that are of a extreme or high level of violence, as we see here in The Last of Us Part Two trailer. Uh, but that if they get associated with something that some might see the meaning as women, that they don't want to get essentially dragged into what winds up being a, a social movement. Uh, they don't want to be a part of that story. They don't even want to be mentioned at all in respect of Me Too. And that became a problem when they had Japanese developers making sexually explicit content, making content that they didn't think would fly in the United States where the Me Too movement was really coming to the fore. The second was the emergence of channels on sites like YouTube and Amazon.com's uh, Twitch where gamers play in front of a camera and are watched by fans online. This means that gamers meeting Japan's laxer standards, games meeting Japan's laxer standards, could readily meet worldwide uh, exposure. Uh, 
Yeah, so this is the part that we talked about earlier in the video that I just don't buy. Uh, I think Sony was well aware of streaming for a long period of time. So yes, I think Me Too acts in concert with the notion of streaming and with the notion of being able to see Japanese games a little bit more clearly, a little bit more obviously, and a little bit more easily in America. However, I don't think it's terribly honest to suggest that it's streaming alone, that it's the culprit here. It really does seem to be Me Too as the primary impetus behind this. And then you wind up getting into political discussions, which I don't want to have on virtual legality. I don't want to have here in this episode uh, about whether or not a, a Me Too, a United States based uh, or at least primarily, uh, primarily based uh, political movement should be adjusting uh, what people in other countries expect, what people in other countries do. And, and so I think that's where you wind up getting into difficult conversations. I think that's one of the reasons you see that Sony doesn't actually adopt any guidelines. The next line they say is, Sony is concerned the company could become a target of legal and social action. Again, I find this a little bit disingenuous. There's very little reason to believe they would have legal action put against them, I, with the exception of potentially some kind of underage depiction of, of children in sexual acts, that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm not familiar with the games enough to know if anything really kind of crosses the line there or could potentially cross the line there for United States law. Uh, but it certainly seems to not be crossing any lines in Japanese law uh, unless they're just simply not being prosecuted for reasons that are cultural or societal and that I don't understand and won't understand in a virtual legality episode originating from you know, Michigan, U USA. Uh, and so I think you're really talking about social action more than legal action. And again, it comes back to me too. What you have here is a story. You have reading between the lines of a company that saw Me Too, that saw that they had something that was adjacent to Me Too in these kinds of uh, potentially sexually uh, explicit depictions of uh, girls in their video games that were released in Japan, and then becoming frightened, then becoming concerned about the potential ramifications of having those, and just deciding that that wasn't going to be allowed anymore. And hey, they're within their rights to say something isn't allowed. They're within their rights to say, you can't do this on our platform. You have to meet these standards. Certainly on a technical basis, we're used to that. You have to have a save screen that does X, Y, and Z. You have to have a menu that does X, Y, and Z. That's what certification is to join their platform. But outside of that, we uh, shouldn't necessarily be okay with a major tech company, a company that controls this much of a media landscape, just putting guidelines out there and saying, we'll know it when we see it. And if we don't like it, it's not going to be allowed. And who cares if you spent two years making it or you employed 100 people putting it together? Because we can be darn sure it's not Sony's games that are going to have this trouble. It's not Last of Us. Or I'm going to put up some video of Days Gone when we go to the next section of this video. It's not those games that are going to be in trouble. It's going to be the smaller games, in particular the Japanese games. And so you wind up having this discussion with Sony. And if you're a developer, you don't know how it's going to go until you wind up submitting the materials, which is what some of these developers wind up saying in this article. The next item is in terms of backing of what Sony's doing is in uh, a quote from Matthew Johnson, director of education at Canada-based nonprofit Media Smarts, who said Sony's move was reasonable given the influence game content can potentially have on players in real life. Again, no source is given for that in particular, and no source has been given about these video games that were released in Japan on any effect that they were having on the development of young people or normal people uh, that would have yielded a quote like that. But certainly this person is in the business of talking about media, talking about the dangerous impacts of these various kinds of things. So it goes without a source. It goes without really a counterpoint in this article. Uh, but he goes on to say it's similar to TV networks deciding what is appropriate to air in terms of violence, profanity, and sexuality. And that I find completely disingenuous, and that's because of my understandings of the law. So let's take a look at just a few things that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, has to say about obscene programming under the law. Now, understand the FCC's rules really only apply to broadcast programming. They really only apply to television channels that use the public airwaves uh, to put out materials, to put out whatever it is that they're doing, shows or news or anything else. And so the FCC can use its licensing authority, can use the Communications Act to prohibit certain things. Now, there are any number of court cases, there's any number of case law, there's any number of law school classes that you can take on whether or not some of these rules violate the First Amendment and the right to free speech and all manner of other things. That's for another day. It's very interesting conversation. It's very interesting discussion. But let's take it on its face right now that the FCC has the right to 
to control obscene programming. If we take it as a fact, then we can see clearly that the TV stations in and of themselves don't make the decisions about what they can and can't show outside of the kind of normal decisions of what the content of the program is. You can see here, the FCC regulates obscene, indecent, or profane programming. Although for the reasons discussed earlier, the commission is generally prohibited from regulating broadcast content, the courts have held that the FCC's regulation of obscene and indecent programming is constitutional because of society's interest in protecting children from potentially harmful programming and supporting parents' ability to determine the programming their children will be exposed to at home. Obscene material is not protected by the First Amendment and cannot be broadcast at any time. To be obscene, the material must have all the following three characteristics. An average person applying contemporary community standards must find that the material as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. The material must depict or describe in a patently offensive way sexual conduct, conduct specifically defined by applicable law, and the material taken as a whole must lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So the FCC steps in and talks about what's indecent, what's obscene, what's profane, and that's a government agency. When we look at this Wall Street Journal article, we aren't talking about television stations that get to decide for themselves what they're going to put on the air. They have an entire government agency telling them what is and isn't allowed. So describing Sony's actions as similar to that of the FCC to similar to that of the United States government is entirely disingenuous and doesn't at all match what's happening here. Uh, and that jumped out at me when I was reading this article because it isn't what's occurring here and it isn't a defense that you need to make of Sony. There are good defenses to make of Sony that it's their network, it's their platform. They can decide what's on it and what's not. And if they want to make it so that they, the only rule that they ever put up for developers is you submit it and we'll tell you if it's okay or not. If that's the only thing that they ever want to do, then they're well within their rights to do that. But of course, you know that they won't do that because they want to sell products on their platform. They want to sell products on their system. And if they just said, well, developers, we'll know it when we see it. You can put whatever you want to us and then we'll go from there. If that's all that they wound up saying, then nobody would make any games for the PlayStation platform. You can't develop a game on that kind of arbitrary and capricious standard. You would just go over to Microsoft, you would just go over to Nintendo and try to work within a network, within an ecosystem that has some kind of rules that you can meet, some kind of quantifiable standards that you can get to where you are putting together a game and it's going to be allowed to be sold to people because that's how you're gonna make your money, that's how you're gonna pay your people. Um, Executives and developers at makers of sexually explicit games say Sony used to praise them as an important part of the PlayStation business strategy because their offerings added to the variety of the console's games. But that support has faded, they said, when Sony telling them to find other platforms if they want to keep making such games. What they're saying to us is basically go find a niche somewhere else, said a top executive at a Japanese software company that makes sexually explicit games. The Sony spokeswoman declined to comment on the outside developer's comment saying Sony maintains responsibility to our users as a platform holder. Other software executives object to the lack of written guidelines from Sony. You don't know what they will say until you complete the work and submit it for review, said the chief executive of a small game developer in Japan. And if they are not happy, even if they allowed the same degree of sexuality a few days before, we need to take it back and ask our staff to make adjustments, and that's very costly. Industry consultant Hizakazu Hirabayashi said smaller companies had little power to argue on behalf of their creations. The Sony official in the U.S. said he is aware of what outside developers have been saying, but that he hopes that they would accept how the world has changed. We don't have criteria in written guidelines or that sort of thing because the policy was introduced kind of suddenly in the wake of the Me Too movement, the official said. So... I think that's really the, the nut that's the most difficult to crack. You've got a company in Sony that is acting uh, very quickly. They are trying to respond to what they see as a social and global threat to their market position based on the politics, very specifically of the United States. They're trying to apply that to one of their biggest markets in Japan and certainly the market where their company, their parent company is from where a number of their developers are from, where they are the most popular system. And they're trying to apply these standards in a global way that a number of developers are feeling burned on. And I'm of two minds of this, as you can probably tell from this video. Sony has the right to control what is on their system. 
you can see in the case of Steam and Rape Day that there are issues that can develop if you just have an anything goes policy with what can be sold on your system. And I don't think anybody at Sony really wants that. They certainly don't want to be having the conversations that Valve and Steam did in respect of Rape Day. So you find yourself caught between a rock and a hard place if you're Sony. That being said, I have the same issues with Sony that I have with YouTube and Facebook, what they did with Weedcraft. And I think it's worth holding companies' feet to the fire on this. If you want to have a rule, by all means, have a rule. Set in stone exactly what you're talking about. What bothers you? What isn't allowed? If you've been doing this for a year, Sony, and you've rejected certain things and you've asked for certain changes and you've seen certain things that are okay, then by virtue of that process alone, you should be starting to have certain rules, certain uh, specific ways that you can tell people that are going to be acceptable and are going to survive your review process. That's the nature of going through these things. You've seen what you are okay with. You've seen what you're not okay with. Start codifying that. Start making rules around that. And you will have happier developers. You will have people that at least say, hey, I wish I could do X. But Sony's very specific and says, I can't do X. So I know I can't. Versus, I don't know whether I can do this or not. Should I invest $100,000? Should I invest $500,000 in putting this thing together and get to the end of the day and Sony says, I'm not allowed to sell it? Uh, because if that's the case, then maybe my company goes under. And if that's further the case, maybe I don't even bother to try to do anything in that space at all. And I would much prefer to see rules. I would much prefer to see a robust game developer environment that knows what is allowed and isn't allowed thrive on the PlayStation ecosystem, just like I'd like to see it thrive on the Microsoft Xbox systems and the Nintendo systems and everywhere else. I want to see everybody succeed as much as possible. And I think the best way to do that is clear, codified rules uh, that make clear exactly what uh, everybody is going to have to meet in order to sell a game on your system. And I don't think Sony's done that so far. Um, so I think that's really what I wanted to say about this. I think it was interesting, the timing of the conversation that happened. I think it is interesting that Sony wound up releasing those kind of clips of uh, the PlayStation 5, uh, what it can do uh, through Mark Cerny to Wired the same day something like this comes out. I don't think this is really going to drive the public policy needle uh, against PlayStation uh, as, as much as might be implied by the Wall Street Journal article as, and making a story out of it. That being said, I don't think Sony wanted that piece of news to be the focal point of their news cycle. And so I think it made sense for them to release that information to Wired on the same day that that story went digital on the Wall Street Journal. And I don't think anybody's really been talking about that kind of issue. Now, the other thing that I wanted to add really quickly is that there's a term going around that is very easy to kind of apply to, to these corporations called censorship. Uh, it's not a great use of the term because censorship generally applies to something that can get you thrown in jail that a government is enforcing. And, and corporations really don't commit censorship as much as they enforce their rules or their licenses or their policies. And you can certainly dislike it. You can certainly say it's arbitrary. It's capricious. It's not good. It's not what you would want to have uh, out there. But it's not censorship. It's not censorship when somebody's blocked from Twitter. It's not censorship when somebody isn't allowed to advertise on Facebook. It's just them using their ter terms and conditions and using their policies. Uh, and if that isn't what is written in those terms and conditions, if you haven't violated them and you want to bring that up, then yeah, you can have a kind of breach of contract action. You can have a civil suit. You can have those discussions with those bodies because it's not a government body. It's not censorship. And I don't think you should, if you're interested in talking about these kinds of issues, about Weedcraft, about Sony, about PlayStation, about sexual content, about these guidelines, I do think you can say it, you can describe it in a better, more effective way by not leaning on the term censorship. That's really what I wanted to say in this episode. I will leave you with the final comment from the photo of the thumbnail for this episode, which is uh, Captain Barbosa talking to Elizabeth Swan in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Well, the code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. And welcome aboard the Black Pearl, Miss Turner. As with the other videos we've done on virtual legality, guidelines give great and tremendous power to the enforcing side of the guidelines relationship. Sony has tremendous power to enforce guidelines rather than rules because they are ambiguous, because there aren't any contours around what they mean or don't mean. And that should bother everybody. You don't want, really want one side to have that power and authority over the other. And so rules are always more beneficial. Just like under the law, just like under a contract term, ambiguity is the enemy of two sides understanding what they can and cannot do. 
And so you don't want guidelines unless you're Sony and you want to have that power and you want to have the ability to wield it uh, against your developers and against uh, the folks that might otherwise cause you harm. Uh, and so that's the episode. If you like this video, please do like, please subscribe. If you like the podcast, please review the podcast service and the channel uh, in general or otherwise leave comments if available on that service. Thank you so much for watching or if you're listening to it on a podcast, thank you so much for listening and I will catch you on the next Virtual Legality.